Happy Friday, everybody. We're back for another bioactive live Q&A here with Kevin from OK Calyx Genetics and OK Calyx and Brian from Rubber Ducky Isopods. Uh, welcome back to the show, guys. Happy to see you. I missed a week last week. Yes, you did. Brian and I had a good time finishing up some IMO 4 and 5 of a basically a part 3 of IMOs 1 through 5 and a little bit of early Jadam and KNF information. Yeah, it was a great episode. I listened to it, been chopping it apart and uh, doing as much as I can this week. Just been a busy week for me. Kids on spring break and uh, yeah, life is life. But um, tonight we are here to get into a little more intimate discussion on breeding uh, rove beetles. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, I feel like quite a few people have probably tried this. Uh, some people succeed, some people fail. It's kind of hard to figure out what it is that sometimes that's that's creating that success or that failure. So the uh, point of today's show is to kind of navigate through that, um, set you guys up with a good um, way that I do uh, rove beetle raising. It's not the only, it's not the only way, um, but it is a way that works for me, and it, it's, it's been... Um, very successful for me over the past, you know, four or five years doing this. So, um, here to share that with you guys and, and hopefully share the success. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to throw out a lot of questions. Brian kind of has a little bit of a cold going on. So I'll kind of discuss a little bit more. Brian, just jump in whenever you want to, of course, ask whatever you want to. Um, we're going to start off talking about rogue beetles. This is something, this is, uh, this is a thing, a little buggy that Mark breeds and sells and does uh, sure all kinds of things with. I got some of these rove beetles before in his fungal, fungus gnat eliminator bioactive pack and it eliminated them. Dumped the rest of it in my compost. I'm going to be dumping that dirt in my compost in about one week that I dumped those little, you know, buckets in. But I'm gonna. We have a couple lists of questions. We have a more of a guy, a guy who understands rove beetle questions, and then a guy who doesn't understand rove beetle questions. And that's me. I'm the guy that doesn't understand the rove beetles. Mark is the guy that understands them. I'm sure Brian understands them way more than I do. Also, but what I would like to start off with, Mark, is what does a rove beetle look like? How big is it? How small is it? What color is it? How can you tell it's a rove beetle? What are some things that you look for to try to say, ah, that is a rove beetle? Yeah, so uh, rove beetles are pretty pretty much the first thing that you can distinguish, uh, especially in our packs, but just in like a, a healthy, bustling, active uh, soil system. When you peel back that soil layer, um, you start start getting down into the rhizosphere they're the biggest uh, beneficial organism that's going to be around in your soil. And they look just like what you see on the screen there. You'll see them anywhere from an adult, um, you know, as far as size goes, I think five millimeters is about what size they are. So uh, to, to translate that to real, real terms, that's like about the size of a fruit ant. Um, but they do have a shiny black back, as you can see, and they have that distinguished middle section uh, it's a little bit of like an off-colored brown. So uh, the co I've seen the colors of rove beetles vary anywhere from dark black to uh, light brown and almost even like a reddish color based on where they're at in their adult cycle. Um, and then on the right there, you can see the larva is going to look more like a worm almost. Um, that's like a still shot there, but the way that they move is very worm-like. It's not as beetle-like. Um, so people get thrown off by that. So don't certainly don't. If you see little yellow fast moving worms, um, take a take a time out and and shoot us a question or, or shoot a little like little brown worm online. And um, these guys should come up uh, and they're definitely beneficial. Um, so uh, and then there's also a pupil stage right before they uh, go into an adult they have kind of a black they'll have they'll be somewhere between those two pictures right they'll have a, a clear yellowish body and then they'll have kind of like a blackish top but they'll still be that translucent so um they're cool to see in their different different stages okay so 
Another question. What's the life cycle of a rove beetle? How long is he in that larva pupa adult stages? Yeah, so uh, from so they go from an egg to a larva to a pupa to an adult. Um, that whole process takes about three, three and a half weeks in a perfect environment. Uh, it can take longer. And your success can be limited based on environmental conditions and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> and they say in that time, I can't remember the exact like scientific article I read, but they say in that time in like an opti optimal in, uh, environment that they'll like, they'll 10, 15, 20 X in population in that 25 day cycle. Right. So once they get start getting through uh, like a one or two reproductive cycles, you start really multiplying those populations pretty well. <laughs> so um, they'll spend to get kind of in the weeds real quick on it. They'll spend uh, about seven days if going from an egg to a larva state, and then from the from the larva to the through the the, the next uh, phases. And I believe that there's um, there's three instars, so that means that there's three cycles. And instars like uh, <clears throat> it, it's like a, they they grow in size, right? Like it's it's like a transformation. So uh, during that larval phase, they'll grow gradually th through three different instar phases, stages, kind of. Um, so during that time, it's about seven days from a larva to a pupa. And then another 14 ish days from that, like going through that larva pupa to an adult. And then during the adult phase, um, they're laying, the females lay eggs at like a super high rate. Um, in their lifespan, they'll, they'll lay like six, I think it's like 60 to 100 eggs. So each, each rove beetle female can really multiply well. Um, and at a at a high rate and a lot faster than an organism like a worm um to or ease, sorry, just throw it out there like when someone's buying these packs to ease their mind a little bit uh, do you kind of co-sign the fact of like in a weird way a rogue beetle is kind of like a roach at your house if you see one you should know that there's a bunch of other ones just because you don't see them doesn't mean that they're not around you're talking in your soil, of course, right? Yes, in your soil. Yeah, yeah. For lack of a better, like, analogy kind of thing. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a good analogy. They're kind of like the predators. Um, you don't necessarily want a huge, huge population of rove beetles. A, because they're self-regulating. Um, you know, they're, they're, like, spatially aware, like a worm is, where they... They'll hit a peak on population. You can hit a small pot with a large amount of them, but they'll eventually compete with one another, you know, for top dog. Um, they'll only be able to reproduce as much as their the size of their environment will allow. So um, so once you get to the kind of that le that chi level, right, like the place where you want to be, where there's no gnats, right, you've gone through that, those reproductive cycles, you're now at like a balanced kind of like set population you're really only gonna unless you're like tapping into like a nesting spot which you will find like i'm sure people if you dig around in your soil <laughs> enough um you'll find a spot where there's just like holy crap there's a ton right here um but it in generality you're gonna you're gonna see them like passing right you're gonna see one flying by um you're not necessarily gonna see and it's not necessarily normal to see 50 or 100 every time you peel back your mulch layer and i don't think that that's ever really it can be achieved but it's not sustained um because because of the things kind of i said before where they'll compete they'll regulate themselves they'll 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 fall back off uh especially like like environment if it gets cold in your your climate they'll start dropping off again so um has a lot to do with that as well. All right. So before we move on, everybody all out there watching, y'all need to hit that like button about 40 times tonight. Anytime you hear something good, please hit that. Follow us, subscribe, all that good stuff. All right, Mark, moving on to you. Does a male and female rove beetle look different? 
Uh, female will be a little bigger, but you're not going to be able to really tell. Um, like they're going to be a little bigger, just relatively speaking. Um, but you're not going to be able to be like, for sure, that's a female. There's not really any way of, of telling, no. Not that I'm aware of. You might be able to like somehow stop one uh, to get it under a scope to look at some, you know, mar something underneath the body. But they move so fast that like for somebody like me, uh, who only has what's been published out there <laughs> to to use, and I don't have state of the art micro microscope equipment and stuff like that, um, I don't I don't think there's any way to tell. Okay. Do they That's sting? Do they bite? Do they sting? Do they pinch? Can they do any of that stuff to us? Uh, so, so this this species that is uh, you know commercially available as a as a, a bio control, they don't cause any issues. They don't bite human beings at all. Um, there's a certain type of of rove beetle. It's called a, I believe it's called a per, perderis. And it create it's found over in like the Middle East, right? And it creates uh, like dermatitis. So there's actually like a specific type of dermatitis that is caused by this rove beetle. And I've had that question several times before, but it's a different. There's there's thousands and thousands of different types of rove beetles found all over the world. This specific one, the the Staphy lionide or like the Delosia coriaria is what it's called. Um, that rove beetle specifically is, is what's effective against like the pests and stuff like that. Can they fly? Do they just crawl? No, yeah, so they can fly. Um, and they will fly generally only when they are either A, out of food, so like their conditions have completely crashed out and they don't their only option is either to die in place or to try to relocate to find somewhere some greener pasture um or if you do something to really piss them off right like spraying some sort of uh irritating you know and bioinsecticide or inside not bioinsecticide but insecticide uh might not necessarily kill them because they're a hard body but it will definitely piss them off. It fucks up their larva. And, you know, that would be the other thing that would cause. And then the, the, like, the third thing would be, uh, like, digging around in your soil a lot to piss them off. Right? That'll, that'll eventually make them fly. So, so kind of like their habitat to be not messed with much. Kind of. They'll also, you know, I haven't really... I haven't personally seen this with my own two eyes, but they'll jump from pot to pot wherever like that defense is needed. So like in a, a greenhouse setting, they're amazing, obviously, uh, cause they're just going wherever there is a need. Um, and then even in like a commercial setting, um, they'll, they'll jump to the pots where the action is at, you know, where the food is at. And, um, and that's generally where the, the issues are and where they're needed. So, so like in my compost, just as, as an example, in my compost, when I have black soldier flies, I will first see the black soldier flies flying around, the little black, you know, fly. But I have some in Gasoline Alley right now. They've actually popped from my soil. Um, but then I'll see, I'll see the larva, the little eggs that they will lay. And you can actually see a black soldier fly egg with your own eye because they'll lay clusters of them, you know, they'll lay 50, a hundred or more. And they, uh, they like to lay them in little corners, little nooks, little edges that hang over. They'll like to lay them up under there just above the compost or, you know, even on the compost uh, sometimes can, my question is, can you see a rove beetle egg in your soil with your naked eye? If you're looking for it? No, no, you can't. And the thing that I've learned, um, is that by going and trying to find it, and we'll get into that when we get into like building the, building your bin, you know, your actual rearing container, and I'll show you what I use. Um, but I found that by disturbing them greatly, it does disrupt the reproduce reproduction. So like, there's guides that will say to toss toss the culture around, you know, or like mix it up or 
frequent you know over p- periodically and um it there is like a caveat to that because if you're messing with them constantly you're messing up their like their reproduction which is they they may, they make they spin these like silk tunnels basically where they lay their eggs. So if you're constantly messing up their, um, their laying habitat, it's going to mess up the eggs, um, you know, survival rate. So. Sorry, you're muted, Kev. I'm sorry, guys. So you're saying that the rove beetle will burrow a tunnel possibly and then lay lay some kind of silk substance and that's how they yeah lay it's, eggs. yep it's super small um so you're not going to see it with the naked eye i'm sure that there's uh pictures of of them under microscope for sure i got three more i got three more questions on my level for you and then we're going to get into the tougher questions okay is rove beetle rash real it is, but only with that one specific. It's a dermatitis, and it's that one specific species. I read that the blood, its blood, is what will cause the irritation on your skin. Is that it? I don't. I think it's just that one species, um, and I think it's really not found in the country here. Right. And I don't. It's definitely not sold commercially. So we don't have to worry about that. Don't worry about rove beetle rash, everybody. But look it up, check it out. Rove beetle rash, it's actually a thing. Oh, for sure. I think uh, I had it pulled up. It was called. I don't have it here now. I think it's called Puris. I'm not even gonna try it. It's per- like yep. Prodestro dermatitis. Right. Started with a P. I remember. Is there anything that eats rove beetles like? To say like I like rove beetles a lot. Frogs, I'm thinking, would is there any type of uh, I don't know a bacteria that would eat on them? You know, that's yeah. I, I think there's there's definitely organisms in the soil that will that will balance them out. Like um, predatory nematodes is one thing for sure. Um, even us like hypoaspis miles um, in like a you know in a severe cage match scenario. Um, they, they, they will, uh, compete as well. So, um, I've noticed that, you know, they do fine in like a bigger soil volume, but in like enclosed tight containers, um, they, they really do combat one another. Um, final question. My question would be from my environment, the way I do things. Is there a possible way to harvest rove beetles, beetles from nature? Um, yeah, for sure. You just got to go find one. You know, I have them in my garden outside. I find them all the time. Um, and But, like, you'd literally have to go get, like, an aspirator, which is a fancy term for, like, a... Well, if you have kids, you know, probably know what an aspirator is, but it's what you use to suck boogies out of their nose. And they, they make the same thing for uh, sucking up bugs. So you would, you would ideally have to go find, you know, a good starting population, 10, 15, 20 ideally, um, and then start a container and give it time, obviously. And, and yeah, yeah, you, you definitely could. I just don't know. Like I said, there's like 6,000 species. So there's no guarantee that that is going to be, um, you know, biologically beneficial to your to your setup. It probably will be. But I feel right. like a lot They're of not, them. not designed like yours are. To, right. To function in the way you want them to. These, these would just be from nature. You know, whenever I, <clears throat> whenever I would soak scratch grains and lay them out, we would um, lay it about, about an inch thick, um, and that's just a bunch of corn and grains chopped up real fine. But as it would dry, the rove beetles would show up. So that was one way that I've always seen rove beetles come. I don't, you know, I hardly ever see them in my compost. They're they're dark. They look the same. I'm just looking for worms mostly all the time. But I guess that's because they're like the ninjas, like we were saying before. You know, in a good healthy system. You're not necessarily there. They are 
present around the country out in the soil for sure anywhere it's been warm enough and they're active like worms are up there and hanging out those rove beetles will be hanging out but you're not going to see them like you're seeing the other things like springtails and stuff like that they're the predators hiding in the hiding in the bush right so you're going to see them once in a while so they're a little they're a little tricky to find but um if you know what you're looking for like just keep an if you don't have a ton of ants obviously if you have a lot of ants it's a disadvantage but if you if you don't have a lot of ants just keep an eye out for a fast moving little ant looking thing a uh, little black guy shimmery little black guy that's flying flying around you know not flying but m moving fast around okay so those are kind of the amateur questions most of those are mine because i don't know anything about rove beetles you know i don't <clears throat> It, the, the more I act like I don't know, the better off I'll be because you'll tell me everything. Explain it to me like a fifth grader, and that's how I need it. We'll move on into a little bit tougher questions and a little more designed towards what you do, Mark. So the first question would be, how do rove beetles actually benefit our soil? What are they doing? And then you can kind of get into why is that important, you know. So rove beetles are mainly um, predator species. So they're there to... Um, they're insectivore, right? Or like an arthropod ore. I don't know what the proper term for that is, but that's what they basically eat. Soft bodied, uh, insects, whether it be pest species, um, larval stages of thrips. Um, they've been proven to, to help prevent against root aphids with, in conjunction with hypoaspis miles. Um, and fungus gnat larvae are like the three pest and shore flies as well, which we don't really deal with, but it's definitely worth noting. Um, and then when they don't have that kind of stuff to eat, they'll they'll eat the they'll help to balance all the other beneficial um, species in your containers. So like, you're gonna have tons of tiny little soft-bodied arthropods that you don't even really see necessarily. They'll they'll munch down on those. Um, and they they'll help to continue to kind of turn that uh, the living side of the nutrition in your so soil food web and then um sorry i was i that was pretty much the end of that muted you're, you're muted again what are they feeding on? <clears throat> Do they like to feed on organic matter? Do they eat bacterias? So it, it seems like they'll eat, they're kind of like a detrivore. Uh, they'll, they'll eat like um, breaking down uh, Benny Boost is a really good uh, food source. Uh, scratch grains is a really good food source. But they're also going to be eating on the, the, the tiny, tiny, simple organisms that are actually feeding on those things as well. Um, so they're kind of like a double edged sword. That's what they're feeding on. They're feeding on a lot of soft bodied organisms. Um, and then I think that they're also eating some, some organic breaking down matter as well. Cause that's, we'll get into that as well, but they're with the, the good foods that we use to, to raise them. But yeah, they're definitely feeding on that as well. All right. So you're talking about <clears throat> raising them and you rate, you seem to raise a lot of things, springtails, rope beetles, Brian raises lots of arthropods known as roly polies isopods i saw oh, sorry isopods if if you were wanting to breed your own or start to raise your own you know rove beetles or a certain style of rove or a certain uh, type of rove beetle what is the setup look like what is this what does the bin look like the material they live in the food you feed them the moisture all that what does that look like yep hold on one sec i put it just out of reach okay <clears throat> y'all keep hitting that like button for us you can go check out okcalyx.com i got all kinds of things up there go check out rubber ducky isopods check out his all of his designer isopods he's got and then mibeneficials.com also so um they uh, let's see as far as uh environment goes for uh, rope beetles, they need air. So you got to have a container that's got some sort of air on the sides. Ideally, you can do it all the way around the, the, the sides, the top. Uh, I do it on the, at least the front and the back. <clears throat> and then uh, a really tall, this one's about six inches tall. 
and you can see I have it about half, you know, quarter to third full of uh, substrate. And then um, <clears throat> you don't have to go with this big. You can go with much smaller, but I wouldn't go any smaller than like a two liter. Um, and again, you need to have airflow. You can't. Um, and if you're if you're putting holes in the tops of these things, just make sure you don't put stuff on top of them because I've made that um, mistake as well. Um, and then so just to kind of run through the box, um, you know, get a hole saw. The best thing to do with plastic, especially, is you got to get a backer on it. So get a piece of wood on the back of it with the hole saw, run it reverse so that it melts a nice clean hole. And then um, once you get the hole nice and cleaned up, <clears throat> hot glue, and you can use uh, stainless steel mesh is really good. I would use like 120, 120 to... 220 is going to be uh, probably your best bet. You can go a little coarser than that, but don't go any coarser than like a 60U on those. Um, you can go even simpler if you don't want to go and buy stainless steel mesh online. Um, and it also doesn't have to be this exact container. It can be any like so container shaped, kind of like a shoe box. So if you have something already at home, go with that. That's how this began for me. Um, that was five years ago, you know, and, and, and it took a long, long time to dial these things in, not necessarily that I'm telling you right now, but what we'll go through, um, took a long time to figure that all out. So, um, the hot glue is really good. I've tried a lot of other glues, they fall apart and uh, hot glue is going to be I ideal for that application. Um, what else? As far as the substrate goes, uh, the stuff that I like to use is an organic cocoa core. And I mix that 50-50 with uh, like a fine ground vermiculite. It's got to be nice and airy for them so that they can easily make channels to get around in this container so that they can make it out and expand that population out so they're not like on top of themselves in, in little pockets uh, trying to compete. Um, so let's do a, let, let me add, right in line with that happy dirt dude asks what is a good temp for them to grow in ideal condition 70 to 80 degrees um you're gonna want 50 percent humidity at least the drier it is the harder it is for sure um that's why brian probably struggles a lot out there in colorado um and they can sustain in temperatures basically almost to freezing. Mm -hmm. um, they can actually get to freezing and go into diapause and they'll still come back as long as it's not for an extended, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure what that period is, but as long as it's not super cold and it's as long as it's not a long time. I think we got a comment of the night. Rick Easley, Ringo Starr was the useless beetle. Solid, solid. Well, I actually had an idea. Uh, my One of my next uh, shirt ideas was going to be that it, it was going to be the Beatles on Abbey Road, but it's going to be Abbey Rove. And then instead of like the Beatles silhouettes walking down the piano keys, it's just going to be Rove Beatles silhouettes walking down the piano keys. But I thought it was I thought it was super niche. <laughs> yeah, you better hurry up and make that real quick now that you announced that one. That's, That's fine. Go for it, guys. There you go. Gold nugget. All right, so um, happy third dude asks, can I use microscope tape? Or no, I'm sorry, micropore tape to cover the air holes. And you're not gonna get enough airflow with the micropore tape. Uh you need something so uh like a cheaper option than stainless steel mesh. Um, which is not that expensive, but uh, if you didn't want to go that route, you could go with like a landscape fabric. Um, you could even go with like felt, like felt uh, paper. You know, you just cut a square, glue it on there. Um, I would just, filter? sorry, say that again. Oh, did you say coffee filter? Or would that work? I don't know coffee filter that. won't be a durable enough. You want something more durable and it's got to be like there's got you don't want a bunch of other other organisms getting in and contaminating these bins. Um, 
you want it to stay as pure as possible for as long as possible because it does I, and i'll go over that too later but there is a sweet spot time time in these bins so you have to have them right for when they're humming and then eventually that they they drop off and it does happen and there's just just part of the it's part of the game and part of part of what i do so what about a micron bag like for pressing rosin that's what case yep yep that would work great too um again i'd keep it between like 120 and 220 so if you have something in there that's that's perfect <clears throat> so tell me again what's the most ideal uh, uh temperature or humidity so the ideal temperature is going to be 70 to 80 uh, Fahrenheit and humidity is about 50 to, you know, 60% humidity. Um, and then nice early springtime for you guys. Yeah. For me anyway, it would be, yeah. Yeah. Like uh, late spring <laughs> summer here. Ideal. Um summer is the cranking times if you're if you're bound by environmental conditions so like if you're running this in the basement like you would be with a a worm bin as, as you would notice with a worm bin they'll drop off in the winter and they'll pick up in the summer so um if you're bound by that just be aware of that and it's not that you're failing it's just that that's that that's how they react they go slower they'll still survive they're super resilient um but they'll go a lot slower and yeah all right so give us some some of that inside baseball secret stuff how do you in your box that you have how are you managing to keep that 70 to 80 temperature and around that 50 percent humidity what you we've already talked i mean say it again you've discussed the design but that's part of this whole process allowing the flow to come in how high that you know how tall your box is compared to how much material you got in there also is another way you can control that humidity you know if you got too much more too much dirt in small box you got too much humidity and in reverse that you don't have enough humidity so what are some of those things that you're doing and you're looking for to keep that that look that you like to have on that box you know yeah so um i like to keep a i got a i, I sorry um I like to keep a moisture gradient. So uh, on one side of the box, I'll have it nice and dry. And on the other side of the box is where I'll keep it a little bit more moist. Um, and definitely not, not sopping or too moist. Um, but that is a key right there is, is having it so that uh, they have different places to go in different stages of life. Um, so if the whole thing's super wet, but what I but with what having said that, when I start my bin, I kind of treat it like um, I treat it like starting a new living soil bed, it, only in the respect that I get the soil even or the substrate evenly moist to begin, so that I can dial that gradient back, so I can control the side that's got the moisture, um, without it going completely hydrophobic on me on one side or keeping chunks of cocoa core in there i would go through the process of rehydrating a cocoa core if that's what you're doing if you've got loose great just make sure that it's evenly damp not wet um and then set up your wet side from there let them settle in let that dry gradient come back that would be your my best advice um, rather than going in super dry with your substrate not getting it properly hydrated to begin with that's going to be a no-no in this too, because you're going to limit the space for those organisms to breed as well. Are you monitoring monitoring your uh, temperature and humidity with any type of gauges, or is it just a look that you go by? Uh well, I have a I have a special like area that I keep at at the right um, temperature and humidity and stuff like that. And I have spring tropical springtails that do really well in warmer temperatures. So I have the ability to uh, adjust those things. You know, that's if you can put it at see here's here's a tough one is raising beetles is not really the most appealing thing to the roommates and wife. Um, so generally speaking, it's going to get stuck in the basement if you're lucky to even be given the green light on that um 
they are contained that's the definitely like people are like whoa that's weird but they're completely contained um and uh what was i gonna say about that i i, I lost the train but um so if it sounds like the idea of growing in a box a shoe box size container would be the easiest way to start like you said go back and listen to all the little gold nuggets that he gave you. But now when I've got my box and my material and I'm understanding temperature and humidity, how many rove beetles am I needing to start with? Is it, do I need just two of them or do I need in numbers? What's that all about? I would go with at least 50 to a hundred in your starter bin would be a good number to start with. You could go less. Um, but the most important thing is to set your expectation appropriately because like we talked about earlier the life cycle takes about three and a half weeks in a perfect condition so um i guess what you should expect to see during the transformation of your box from going from like a starter culture right like you okay you've added your 50. in about a week you should start seeing some of those little yellow guys that we were talking about um those guys right there. Can you guys see that? Yeah, man, that's great. That's a good setup. So those guys on the right, you should see those in about a week. And then in about three to four weeks, you should notice a quite a bit difference in the number of adults that you have running around in there. Um, and so now that we got them yeah. what are we going to feed them how do we keep them alive how long will they stay alive in that nice condition if we've got it pretty dialed in you know are they going to survive months if we're able to feed them or do they need to get out and do stuff yeah so they will they will stay you know a, a, a box will last for months um and the best way to maintain them is to so when you start your your box you, we talked about getting the substrate kind of like moistened um getting it in there you want to fill it up to about a quarter to a third and then um get your beetles in there and um start off with about a tablespoon of of some sort of food right so if you're going super cheap which is totally fine and no we sell Benny Boost. We don't really make a whole lot on Benny Boost, but it is essentially scratch grains. Um, it's just a higher grade of scratch grains that we sprout um, and, you know, kind of inoculate in that sense. So you can use Benny Boost. That's what we use because we make it. It's cheap for us. It's great for us. It's worked amazing. Um, but essentially what it is is it's barley, corn, um lentils it's got oats and it's got wheat bran and you could cut probably you could probably cut some of that out you don't need to um but that like you could also do it with just oatmeal works okay it's not as good um and the scratch grains work okay not as good um benny boost is what we like to use but like if you just had barley and corn like go ahead and grind those up but you want to grind it up into a nice fine powdery mist like not mist but a nice fine powder and that's what you really want it to be in and just a tablespoon to start let it go you know a week 10 days give it a little bit more you know as the population grows but i would say in that first three weeks while your population of adults is getting to size i'd keep it at maybe a tablespoon a week um, and then what you might find over a course of time is that, you know, you have kind of an accumulation of food, especially if you have a smaller amount of substrate and the best thing you can do with that accumulation of food and sorry to back it up. The way that I, I like to put the food in is I put it in a vein, so I'll scratch it in, put it underneath, just under the surface, cover it up and kind of moisten that strip. Um, I've also done it where I just have a big dry spot dry hump of it exposed to the surface it gets covered in mycelium and all sorts of crazy fungus and shit the rove beetle don't give a shit they love that too um that works as well you can do that with oatmeal just oatmeal just moisten it a little bit so it's nice and moist for them to to get into um 
you can also um this is kind of we talked about this earlier as a no-no but you can all some people like to put like you put that tablespoon in you close the container and shake it so that it mixes into the substrate you can do that too but i don't like disrupting that that reproductive cycle i've noticed that that does affect it right rusty nails asks do you sprout the beans and the the grains first or no in the benny boost we definitely do so um, on, so, so on your website and do i do we have the ability to go to mibeneficial.com order rove beetles order benny boost order substrate order boxes what is there for us to get if we're trying to breed these rove beetles now I thought about this question and thought about, you know, having the boxes available for sale and maybe I'll do that one day. Cause I do it, but for now, the best thing you can do. So we sell the Benny boost and we sell Rove beetles. Um, and, um, other than that, you're on your own for the cocoa core and the vermiculite mix. And I, that might change one day if, you know, I, if people are really, if there's a lot of response to this, then certainly would, um have that as an option for people to make this easier but um yeah you got to source those things yourself but the benny boost and the rose we got you so <clears throat> go check out mibeneficials.com and that's where you can find this stuff and get it set up quickly now when you're feeding them i'm imagining a shoe box size box about a, about a third full of substrate right all the temperatures are good all the humidity is good I'm thinking I'm feeding about a spoonful or are you doing a table, a teaspoon? How much Benny boost are you sprinkling into that vein that you talked about? So I'm just doing, sorry, I'm just doing, um, at first, like I said, about a tablespoon and then I'll work it up to two or three tablespoons every seven to 10 days. Once the population gets up and that, that I don't exceed that, that two or three tablespoons. That would be the most that I go with. And then as far as moisture goes, because you're going to want to monitor that as well. Um, it I moisten my Benny Boosts when I apply it. So um, I do add a little bit of, of water to that. And then I add a little, when I cover the, the Benny Boost up, like I said, I like to vein it, put it in, cover it back up with some of the substrate, moisten that. So I know exactly where that vein is too. You know, when, next time I check it, I can... I know if I need to dig into it to I'm, I'm, I'm a hands-on guy too. So I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't picking in my boxes to see how we're doing. It's part of it. You know, I'm making sure I'm still on, on point because I got to keep those populations roaring. That's my business. <clears throat> All right. So what if I feed it too much? What if I feel like I've put too much food in there? It might look, you know, globby or blobby or something. So maybe I poured too much in there. What happens if that happens? um it'll just turn so if it's exposed to the air you know it'll turn into a crazy looking what you would probably call an imo of some kind um it is it that's what it looks like it just got it's going to have rainbow colors based on what the environment is you know generally yellow if it's like a warm environment more blues and greens in the colder environments um so it'll turn into that and at some point it does become non-appetizing to them Sorry, I'm losing my, my curtain here. Um, so and, Rick Easley asked, do rove beetles help spread around bacteria and mycelium? I don't know about the, I don't know about that sp specifically, but certainly springtails do. Um, and by consuming those and rubbing on them, and rove beetles do have these little hairs on them. So, I, you know, I, I, I would think that they do for sure. But not as much as springtails, because springtails are going to hang out down in that root zone more these guys hang in the top rhizosphere so in that in that area in that top two inches they'll they'll be moving whatever's up there um, are these good for compost oh yeah really good for compost um they they're they're also like i said they're like a detrivore as well they'll help break break stuff down and um and speed that process up too and i just think that having that pest defense in the in the compost or in your cast worm bin especially too um every time you apply that to your to your uh beds it's money man that's to me that's that's like the gold standard um 
if you have a worm bin that's closed in and controlled and you can set, you can have it at a, you know, 70 degrees, like the rope beetles like, and like the worms, like you can get that thing humming where you're producing this unbelievably valuable, uh, casting material. That's full of life too. It's not just waste material. It's also crawling with, um, visible biology. <clears throat> so We've got the box size, the soil, the temperature, the humidity. I know where to buy everything that I need. I know how to feed them, what to feed them. I know the, the moisture gradient going on, one side a little moist, one side a little dry. I know that they stay in the rhizosphere. Let's see. What then am I going to do once I get a good, healthy box going to rove beetles and everybody's happy and healthy? What am I supposed to do with this stuff now? I mean, kind of obvious that we would put it in to help fungus gnats put it in the compost like you were just mentioning but are we going to harvest out a, a one cup full of this or how are we harvesting rove beetles out now where are we applying them how long should we wait till we harvest and then how long should we wait till we harvest again that's good questions um so uh what they i would wait at least um I would wait as long as you possibly can before harvesting, which or, you know, six, seven, eight weeks, because I I like to have a really good number of active rove beetles in my my bins before I start doing any heavy harvesting. Um, so, that, so if that's a fuzzy word to us, active, does that mean you're seeing the whole top layer crawl when you knock some dust, some dirt back? Are yeah. You seeing them on the top or is it like you're, the food amount is going down quicker than normal? Yeah, no, I'm talking about seeing a ton of them on top um, cruising that surface layer. Because what that tells me is that there's a lot of guys out there, so they'll have the, like their they'll have like their kind of their soldier movers um, up on top and you'll notice. So like when you start a bin up, right, you'll notice what seems like your population diminishes, but what's happening is, is they're settling into their environment. They're building their, they're building their homes and stuff. They're doing what they do. They're reproducing. The larvae are very active. So you'll see them come out. You're not really seeing like a crazy amount of adults for that first six weeks seven weeks right so then when i start to really see the adults when they come up when like because that that like it's it's almost like you get through that third reproductive cycle and then there's just there's just like more than enough in the container and it's clear right you, you're just seeing them moving everywhere um i'll try to post a video of a bin that looks like that i wish i had one on hand right now but um at that point so i so actually sorry time out leading up to that i we i we'd spoken about you'll find that food material is kind of like no longer appealing right like it's kind of gone bad and what you can do you can even do this weekly the the there'll be a lot of rove beetles hanging out right on that food right so even if you do this weekly just take that glob of food out that's why i like to mark it with some water to know where it's at too take that out right put that in your compost bin now you got the biology in there that's going to break down that chunk of of food further than the rove beetles could do so it'll, they'll take care of that but you're also effectively inoculating whatever it is that you put that chunk into um so for the first six weeks you're not necessarily not hitting anything um you're not like you're not necessarily not harvesting anything you're just not harvesting you don't really want to harvest at a higher level you just want to take that chunk those chunks out get them out of there replace the food so they got fresh food um and and then after the six weeks as far as harvesting goes the best ways to do it uh you can if you're trying to go with like a gentle approach Take, take the food out that you've put in, so you, you cut them off of any food source, take that chunk of food out, and countersink a little cup in there with like a little bit of Benny Boost or oatmeal. Get it wet with water so it's a chunk, and make sure that that cup is like three inches deep, right, so that they'll be stuck down in there. And you can put a few of these around the, sink them in so that they're level with the, the dirt level or the substrate level. Give it a day or two. They'll you they'll be loaded with those, especially if you've cut off any other food option for them. Um, 
The other way to do it is that when you see him cruising on the top, you can literally just scoop out. Um, you could just take a cup, right? Just take a cup of them right off the top. Get a pretty good idea of, of you know, if you're not, if you're not like selling them and trying to get an exact quantity, you can get a pretty good idea of what you're inoculating your, your pots with. You know what I mean? Um, and then the other way to do it is you make one of these type, these type enclosures. And if you're in like a greenhouse setting, it might make sense for you to literally take that box right into the greenhouse and you can open that thing right up. You can pull the mesh off the side if that's better for you. You can open up the top and just let it literally set it there, and they'll go. So you can Would do you it that simply. To put food in the box, kind of as a feeder idea. At that I'm point, thinking. yeah. At that point, once you let them kind of go, right. um, so, so you could let yeah. So like they'll some of them will stay in the box, especially if you keep the food around. I would say yeah, keep some food around. Those guys, like we were talking, like I was saying, those chargers, those workers, or whatever, those those strong men, they're gonna go. They'll be gone. But the, everybody who's like breeding and stuff, who, uh, kind of sticking in the in the tank, they'll they'll stay. So you'd be left with like a a, a, a fraction of your population of that bin, but it, that will work just fine. So this sounds like you know just a good idea, especially for my gasoline alley. Or I'm thinking even the commercial grows that I go to. A lot of people, you know, they like to release ladybugs or mantis or anything like that, just to kind of do stuff sometimes, just to kind of help keep keep things in in monitor if they can. But you know, taking a box into my gasoline alley and just letting them sit there and breed, leave the lid off, I'll put a little food every once in a while, or doing that in a grow, have a couple of those boxes in there, just let row beetles come and go as they please helping things be beneficial. That's a great idea, actually. And I get, and you know, the other way that you did was when you sent me the little, the smaller boxes, the smaller totes, I don't know what are those called? Like a little, little bit, container. Little container, little soup container thing. You know, They're I just- called jelly the, cups. A deli cup, thank you. So when you sent me the deli cup full of the rove beetles, I just shook those in. Could that little container be used to just continue to breed them and instead of shaking them in, just open that thing up? Um, yeah, you could, to, you could you could to some extent, but it would be it's a it's pretty tight. Like you want to be probably in two liters or bigger container. Um, so it doesn't have to be like a couple gallon size container. It doesn't have to be a gallon, but it's got to be big enough to give them a bedding. Um, to give more space but also what i sent you was the biodiversity pack so it's going to be loaded with stratiolalips it's going to be loaded with like springtails and other stuff so um so there's a little more going on there like it wouldn't do as well in that like we're we're kind of finding this out over time like they don't necessarily like shelf well um and brian we we've kind of learned that a little bit together with these is that the there's like a battle that goes on inside these containers after about two weeks and it's it's not uh, it, it, we have to go further than that but it's not ideal for growing populations because like i also said they're spatially aware and those come loaded with more than enough rove beetles to be over comfortable in that spot so that's why we have like I, I put a disclaimer, you know, as best as I can. Granted, we have 100% customer satisfaction. We always try to do the right thing. But we ask you to let us know within 24 hours if there's issues. For That's one of those reasons. Um, also, there's there's factors in storing them. Like people think they're like worms, so stick them in the fridge. And they, they do better in like a warm 70, 80 degrees. So it's there's, there's caveats to all that stuff. And they are... Um, um they are living organisms at the end of the day uh they're just they're just uh they're able to put up with a lot so <laughs> kind of lose sight on that okay so i think we're gonna have a video that we're gonna be able to show uh brian why don't you go ahead and introduce this for us you want to do that tell us a little bit about what it is and then ho hopefully we can watch it do and that and i'll get this set up Okay, we'll have a few minutes to discuss it and kind of lead into a little bit of next week, possibly. Might give us some ideas. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, um, so I, I, I do have a little bit of a cold, and I didn't want you guys like hear me sneeze and shit all, all for the hour. So I was, I was researching some stuff, 
Uh, and I've watched a lot of the videos, to be honest. Uh, Matt Matthew Gates has a lot of um, like when you're talking more scientific tech videos, uh, how the Rove Beetle kind of almost has like a convertible style of how the wings come out. Uh, Matt's been able to um, record that or had somebody record it for him. And it's uh, on his uh, YouTube channel. So when I'm seeing some Rove Beetle uh, content, uh, one of the coolest things that I came across of was that there's so many road beetles that they obviously have to compete with a lot of things. One of them being like uh, carpenter ants, um, uh, regular ants, termites, that kind of stuff. And over time, it seemed like there was always like violence and it was very tough for the road beetle to be able to compete. And so this video breaks down how at least uh, one species of road beetle was able to trick an entire ant colony uh, into thinking that they themselves were also ants so that they allowed them in, um, you know, open arms and they were able to steal the food. Uh, so this video is about three minutes long uh, and I promise you it's three minutes well worth of your time. I wouldn't waste your time otherwise. Give the tiny rove be I don't know. Mark, are you so, doing that? Sorry, hold on one sec. Um, can you hear it when I play it? Yeah. A little studied insect that mimics ants and termites to live in and prey on their colonies, undetected. And a boy, Joe Parker, who turned a childhood passion into a scientific quest to understand the extraordinary evolutionary journey of these beetles. Parker discovered the world of insects and the rove beetle at a very young age. I have been really interested in insects since I was a, a small child. All of the rest of the world fell away and it was just me and insects. The beetles, beautiful under a microscope, are common in Wales where he grew up. But it's the way some species have evolved that made Parker commit his life's work to the insects. Here's how it went. Ancestral rove beetles entered colonies to prey on ants or termites using their chemical gland for defense. The approach was classic. Enter, attack, escape. But over time, some beetle species evolved a sneakier approach. They began to live in the colonies, masquerading as termites or ants. If you can get your foot in the door of an ant colony, there are no other predators. It's climatically controlled. It's full of resources, so you can feed on the ant brood and food that the ants have harvested to your heart's content. What allowed the beetles to survive in the ant colonies were major evolutionary changes in body and behavior. The defensive gland at the end of the abdomen evolved to produce chemicals that made the beetles smell like colony members. Instead of harming the ants, they tricked them. In some cases, the ants were even drawn to the smell, and their bodies were transformed. Legs and antennae grew longer, their abdomen slimmed. The result, they came to resemble the ants. Even more surprising is that this wasn't a single event passed on from one ancestral line. It happened many times. Over millions of years, at least 12 separate lineages of rove beetles have independently gone through the same transformation, from a free-roaming solitary beetle to a social insect living with ants or termites. The big question is what genetic changes cause these transformations. And this is the part that really excites Parker. There's some, clearly something special about these beetles compared to almost all other forms of animal life that kind of poises them, predisposes them evolutionarily to be able to do this. He now has his sights set on mapping and comparing the genes of many rove beetle species. The research could provide some deep insights into the nature of evolution the process that has made both beetles and humans who we are today. And it all started with a childhood passion. All right, so I just kind of wanted to show you guys that uh, the rogue beetle, in my opinion, is obviously from that video, and Parker's obviously a scientist about it, uh, that they're way more intelligent than obviously you're going to give credit for. And I feel like when I first got into vermicomposting, you know, you just think about it, ah, it's a fucking, it's a worm. But when you start to see that they're actually building up this rhizosphere, when you start to see that however the, they communicate, 
uh, if there's not enough of a food source, like Mark had mentioned at the beginning of the show, they self-regulate. And so when you, you start to learn that rogue beetles are doing the same kind of thing, uh, for the most part, uh, springtails kind of do that too if they're running out of resources, but they, there's always like a ton of springtails. But you notice it more with composting worms and rogue beetles. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that I, I hope that you guys see that this little world, just because it's tiny, doesn't mean that they're not down there figuring stuff out. Um, and if they're able to trick ants and take their resources, that kind of stuff, then I would imagine this is why the road beetle in a, in a living soil cannabis farm becomes the apex predator because it's constantly around moving around. So when you use these, especially if you're commercial cannabis farming and you're using a road beetle, you're using hypiosis miles and you're using a, a non-webbed uh, jumping spider, th those are the apex predators that I think is money well spent. Return on investment is some of the best that I've ever seen when you're using this. And the, the cheapest and easiest way is for the biodiversity packs. I've personally seen it for over two years now. I know Kevin has just seen it for himself. Um, we're obviously a, a big fan of Mark, but at the same time, we have to get our work done and we, we need things to be accomplished. And I was joking with uh, Kevin, there's just not enough hours in the day, you know, some days and stuff like that. So when Mark's product is being beneficial, when things are improving week after week, excuse me, month after month, this is the kind of stuff that we want to see. So don't think that just because you're adding that in there, that this is some kind of like, uh, throw it on the wall. We're hoping to find success. Uh, this is an actual apex predator that's going out there and hunting a lot of the issues in the pockets and the corners of, a, of your farm uh, or your grow uh, to be able to find that stuff for you 24-7. So that's the kind of stuff where we're talking about not only understanding Mother Nature, but kind of improving modern Mother Nature and moving forward. And what Mark has just given you from my limited research online and YouTube and rope beetles, he's just given you the playbook better than any other video except the one that you guys just saw all the other ones in my opinion are a waste of time it just tells you about a road beetle you know i mean once you understand that part it's like all right well tell me more and it doesn't seem like any quality videos do that so again shout out to mark for being able to sit here and rattle this off in real time uh, because there's really no other information out there other than uh, there's a gentleman that was in oklahoma kevin uh he graciously like put his stuff out on the internet i forget his name uh, he has a, a like a grow and, and that kind of thing. He used to have long hair. Uh, Is it you know. Red Bud Soil Company? Red or? Bud Soil Company. There we yeah. go. And he yeah, put shout out, out to him. Right, because I think he's one of the first ones that put out a, a genuine guide. I just didn't find success with it. I mean, I found, I shouldn't say that. I didn't find reproduction success with it. So I felt like I could maybe get him going. That's when we got more into the avocado tech in the early days and that kind of thing. But he definitely put that out before anybody else. So I think it was like an oatmeal. It was on a gradient, if my memory uh, serves me correctly. Yep. Um, but I also think that's old school in, in a little bit because of what Mark has started to see. And because of all of the things that Mark's learned, I also believe that that's why he's ahead of the game with the brightly colored springtails. Appreciate it, guys, um, and appreciate that gobble grows. Uh, it's uh, I I saw you said if I could pick one beneficial insect, it would be the rove beetle. I agree. Um, and just real quick before we get into questions, a um, couple of interesting things about rove beetles. One is that they're used in forensics. Um, CSI will f look for rove beetles at the scene of the crime. And sorry, I'm reading this. Um, they're valuable tools because their life cycle allows forensics entomologists to determine ecological secession and subsequently the post-mortem interval of a cadaver. So they, that information helps them tell how old the how long the body's been there, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. If you guys go back to some of these earlier shows, you're going to know that Mark has a room back there where he keeps dead bodies. And he raises right, trophies, right so. behind this black curtain yeah. here, bud. Um, <laughs> he came behind the curtain twice. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other interesting thing is that they just, it was like an accident that they found the Delosha coriaria being effective against fungus gnats. Um, you know, it was one of these things where they were studying something completely different and they just happened to notice that 
they the rove beetles kept going back this specific species kept going back to the fungus net larva for whatever reason so um then they pivoted that that study and and um you know that's where this became an economic value and such a great addition of the garden so should we get into some questions boys let's see i asked i asked a bunch so let me go back here and look a few rick easy says rove beetles going to bob eat people after watching that video yeah that video was crazy that's uh really good brian i appreciate you bringing that knowledge to us all that all those type of videos do is make me go watch more of those videos and like get into who, who what, what's the study now you know what's happening with them now just a good little project to go get some knowledge with uh, yes rick easley one time will they eat fruit fly larvae yeah based on what brian said they eat soft bodies so soft body larva probably they're going to start chowing on them no just to throw in um caveat there they're not as effective at, against fruit flies so it's important to know the difference between a fruit fly and a fungus gnat a fruit fly is going to have a bigger bulbous body to it the gnat's going to have kind of a more pronounced set of wings a smaller body that's less, less visible you're really just going to see wings on those things um, and fruit flies if you have exposed veg or fruit in your in your pots or your gardens or wherever um they can become if it's not closed off you know they can definitely uh, proliferate there even if you have a very high level of um good biology going on just to throw that out there uh they might eat them but they don't control them so in my experience another question for you there ghetto hippie two can rove beetles be mistaken for types of thrips not that i've ever heard of no no rove beetles are generally dark color um and their soil thrips seem to be more of on a plant i guess and in larval stages the thrips are lighter in color as well so there's a big difference um there is a big difference if you but like if you see um the only way i could see it getting confused would be at the larval stage of a rove and a larval stage of a thrip but the way that they move is so different if it's fast moving and it kind of moves like a worm, like a maggot almost. It, it, it's the best way I can describe it. it. moves like a maggot. It's kind of like, it's weird looking, but um, that's your dead giveaway. Thrips don't move fast like that. They don't got moves like Jagger. They got moves like maggots. Yep. Remember that one. Well, I think that's about all the questions that we have with the guys. If y'all have more questions, ask them real quick. But we are getting close to being done. We're talking with Mark. He's done a fantastic job of giving gold bars, going deep, hitting the backtracks, giving the secret sauces. So if y'all, I mean, I don't even grow rove beetles, but right now I at least have a picture in my mind of a of the path I'm going to take, you know, which is super duper helpful to have somebody sit there and say, no, you should do this and you should do this. Here's what I do. And guys, that is so beneficial and it's valuable and some people make you pay for those things but mark has given you some excellent knowledge he's given you from step one to step five however many there were to get those to get the box set up all the way to harvest and rove beetles go back and listen to it because you don't capture everything you gotta get, go back and listen to these videos whenever you know it's kind of like reading a good book reading a good book once is very beneficial reading a good book twice is really really beneficial you're going to catch things that you totally missed you will have learned the first things and you'll apply them you'll start to understand them better and then when you read the book again you're like that's what he meant now i really get it so going back and watching the video of just you know mark talking about these things you'll be like oh yeah there we go and the, the chain will be connected and then when you spend money on these things, you're going to go into it with knowledge and wisdom that you need to be successful. So go back and watch the video again. It's going to be very helpful for you. KCMO Grow, this information is going to change. What do you say? Going to change gardens out there. That's right. Going to change some gardens out there. That's what we're going for, guys. We want to help you guys out. The information we give is free to you guys. We all have our websites. We all have our hustle that we do. We all sell things that helps our families out. So we definitely want you to help us out. Checking out our web pages. There's mine, okcalyx.com. But tonight, the focus is on Brian and Rove Beetles, and he's got a lot of things. If you go look on his website, he's also got that hoodie that we all have and that we're all wanting, the MI Beneficials, Bennies with Benefits. 
R rated. I'm, I'm down to. I'm only. I, I only have two mediums left, guys. Um, they went. They went hot. Um, I, I saw Terp Wizard the other day. He's got one now. Um, a bunch of man. It's so crazy. I I threw a um. I threw a diaper party. Uh, it was a pinball tournament for my buddy Organomelts, Kyle. And um, you know, it was a it was a my beneficial sponsored event because um, you know we we put up the money for it, and I put up like a couple of banners around the place, and I uh, joked that we were doing a forty five minute timeshare about Rove Beetles. Um, and once we're through that, you know, but. Man, I so I gave away one of my hoodies as the win to the winner of that, and after that, because of how comfortable these things are, seriously, how comfortable these things are, I had like six people. So now I have more people. Six people bought these hoodies, and one person bought one of my hats from the pin. But they don't even buy from me. We're friends in the community, obviously, and they're supporting me as a friend, and uh, you know, and I'm a, they know I'm a small business and all that fun stuff. But um, they wear it more. Like I, I have, I have walking my beneficials pinball. I'm like a, I'm sponsoring pinball players out there now, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. and it feels great, dude. So I, the point of that is that I'm real proud to only have two of these mediums left, and uh, the three of us have been talking about doing like a collab. So we're working on a, a logo for the show and just kind of have our own identity on this thing so that we can um share that too so um stay well, tuned on that stuff why don't we wrap this up everybody's been listening for a while appreciate yep. mark all your talking that, that you give uh that you give us i'll go first i'll hand it off to you brian and mark you can close us out guys go to okcalyx.com and okcalyxshop.com i'm about to have a really nice product that i have not seen anybody do i'm going to call it the cradle of life and it's going to be pretty cool. I've got to put some stuff together. It's going to take me a couple of weeks to get it, but it will be milled. And then when you get it, it will be in an awesome, awesome organic form. I can't wait to get these things going. Um, check out OK Calyx uh, on Instagram, OK Calyx Genetics. I've got a bunch of FIM seeds that we are about to harvest. Kid Mac, Fat Beard Pothead, Scissor Tail Sovelness, me, some other guys around here. We're going to get them quick. We're going to try to pop them as fast as we can, get them in the ground this summer, do a little hunt on a couple of them. One of the regs that I did was a um, blueberry chimera cross to my sque cross to squealer killer, which is a collab with me and Ganja Farmer. Those are going to be some reg seeds that I've done. I haven't done regs in a while, so I'm excited about those, actually. Um, that, that sounds good. That's chimera 2, cross to Bluetooth, and then cross to our squealer killer, which is a great, fantastic, gassy blueberry terp, but... OKCalyx.com. Y'all go check it out. Brian, tell us what you got, brother. Uh, yeah, just again, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to everybody that's supporting. Uh, I have basically two brands now with uh, Terrarium Tribe, ShopTerrariumTribe.com uh, and RubberDuckyIsopods.com. Uh, so again, just appreciate everybody coming to that. Uh, more, more and more people are starting to actually come to the website. Uh, we're hitting over 100,000 on the Terrarium Tribe and over 50,000 on Rubber Ducky Isopods. So uh, those are, those are actually big numbers for a small um, uh, small little like uh, Shopify store. So I just appreciate everybody checking it out. And if uh, if something uh, makes sense to you, please uh, help us out, purchase it. Uh, we're starting to get a lot of five star reviews for the fact that we're going above and beyond with every purchase that comes out of the uh, space. And um, yeah, over here, what do we have going on? Just we have some awesome um, colored springtails on the site as always. Uh, our populations are crushing, and so that translates to uh, really good starter cultures for people, and uh, that's also translating into some five star reviews. Which is really try not to um, let that make or break me, but it sure does feel good uh, getting a five star review um, for going above and beyond. So. Check those out, guys. I really do think that there's applications for these these colored springtails in living soil in the compost. Um, the way that they I've been experimenting with them, and the way the way that they break down and eat stuff differently than the white ones do that we are north, used to seeing, just kind of your standard Fulsomia Canada. 
um, is pretty interesting and it's riveting and it's, you know, like the blues, for example, are twice the, the decomposer of a white. So I'm excited to explore that whole thing. I have new species of springtails coming out and, um, I think in future episodes, we'll definitely get into culturing springtails. Cause I, I hope that people, uh, would find interest and value in doing that as well. Um, so check us out, mibeneficials.com. Always, always a pleasure spending the hour with you guys. And until next week, everybody, hope you all have a great week. And happy, uh, happy Friday. Happy, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Friday. Happy Easter. <laughs>